I want to give uh, a little background just on myself. Uh, before working in development, uh, I worked in manufacturing for a number of years in uh, housing construction, which has a very defined estimating uh, background. It's a very tangible kind of product to work with, and you know when you're when you're able to see something and it's it's a very ordered process. Estimation is a really um, you know, it's very different than software construction. And about 10 years ago, I moved into the software industry and worked as a developer, then worked as uh, a project manager. So I've had a lot of experience with uh, kind of all sides of, uh, of estimation. I also, when I, the very first one I started 10 years ago, I worked for a firm that was purchasing software services. So, uh, you know, I've been on the client side uh, and have also been uh, on the side of um, of de developing and uh, producing the estimates, which is part of what I do here at Promat. So, um, with all of our uh, folks, you know, the first thing I would say is estimating kind of sucks. You know, people uh, there's a lot of um, angst about estimating. Um, if you work with development teams, you know developers don't like doing it. Uh, the final project never or rarely looks exactly like the estimate, uh, and so if you've worked in estimation, you kind of know that, like you know, there's this inertial, uh, uh, there's this initial uh, resistance to estimating because it's this unknown kind of chaotic uh, process that goes on in a lot of organizations. So, so. Uh, why why would we estimate? Uh, you know, so when you're estimating, the main outcomes are you know this is an essential part of what has to happen in order to proceed with a project. You know, we've got to lay the groundwork for what are we going to be doing. Uh, we've got to uh, you know when we have a good estimate, you know that estimate helps our people be. Uh, Happier, both clients and our own developers, because they are not overworked. Uh, you know, we're not having deadlines that we can't meet. We're not over budget. You know, we we created an estimate that's uh, uh, that's going to deliver the project that we're expecting. Um, the reputations, you know, of the work you're delivering is going to be good. Um, so, I want to talk about. There's actually when we mention estimates. Uh, what an estimator may be thinking and what the person asking the question uh, is thinking is uh, often different. So I'm going to introduce some concepts at the beginning of what we're uh, this presentation about uh, estimates and the different kinds of estimates. You know, at the at the very basic estimate is uh, my metaphor is just a crystal ball, and you know, often this is uh, over uh, a conversation or in initially in business, it's like, well, you know, how much would it take to do X? You know, how much time would it take? How much would it cost? Um, and uh, those vary greatly. Uh, I've worked on a number of projects in my career, uh, and the one I think of uh, really the most is, uh, you know, I've delivered e-commerce projects. Uh, the simplest one, delivered PCI was about uh, 60 hours total for the project. Uh, currently uh, at ProMet we have a project e-commerce uh, and that total project is uh, over 4,000 hours. And you know very different projects you know and if you're guessing you know like it's really hard to know. Uh, the second type of estimate is where someone is looking for a target and this target could be either um, Pricing. It could either be, you know, a a price line that we're trying to achieve, and saying, well, you know, I need this e-commerce solution, and this is the budget that we have. Or it may be, I need this uh, web application, but it's got to be up and running in three months. So it may be a, a targeted guideline, and the type of estimate you do for that is different. And the kind of final one, and this is where uh, you know, usually as you get into larger projects or maybe 
business requirements is uh, what I would call, uh, you know, an estimate is looking for a commitment to do something. Just like you know, you're committed when you get that face tattoo. So uh, well, if I you think of when I got my face tattoo, Johnny, <laughs> I committed. That is a commitment. So if you're thinking we're going to tattoo this on our face, and for the rest of our life that's there, you know that is that is a commitment, and the type of activities you do is different for each one of those. Uh, and, the, and the type of what activities you've got to do on the each one and the preparation. So kind of with those in mind, we're going to use that as a backdrop for the rest of our conversation. I want to talk a little bit about the state of the art of estimating. Uh, and I think it's more art than science because software, so much more than building houses, is, is an art. It's a rapidly changing landscape. And it's... Uh, you know, it's an intangible deliverable. Even though we can see it on a on a website, you know, ultimately when we're delivering software projects, you know, it is it is processed. There are some outputs of it, but it's really not something we can go put our hands on. Well, I borrowed some um, some information from uh, Steve McConnell's book on software estimation. I refer to it several times in these slides. Uh, it's an excellent book, and if you like reading something that's uh, 1,100 pages, I strongly recommend it. Uh, software in general is not a place where uh, estimates really, uh, really excel. As an industry, uh, software in general, not just Drupal projects, something like 20% of the projects are failed and abandoned. Uh, somewhere between another um, 40 to 50 percent of projects are late and over budget. And then if we look at projects uh, that are delivered on time and on budget, uh, depending on which year, uh, this, uh, this number is like 25 percent. You know, and as estimators, what we would like to be, estimators and as consumers of estimates, you know, I would really like for all of my estimates to be in that on time, on budget project delivery at the end. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how to get there and make sure that, that you wind up in this blue area. So <clears throat> in the blue area, right? Right. Uh, so we're doing, if you look at an estimate, you know, one of the things that, that I think we all learn, like when you're uh, studying statistics and you're studying probabilities, you learn about the bell curve and you say, well, you know, I'm going to predict an estimate and I have some equal chance of being below that estimate or I have of being above that estimate. And that's really not true. What you really wind up with is to, on a study of uh, projects that are worked on as an industry, uh, what happens is instead of that bell curve, you wind up with a pretty steep line over at the left of coming in under budget. And then most uh, nominal in estimates are slightly to the right of the top of that curve is that most projects go slightly over budget, slightly over time. And then the amount that projects can run over uh, to the right about how much over budget is really an unbounded amount. And that's because when we're estimating, it's rare that you overestimate the amount of work that is to be done and the amount of features to be done. And the things that drive you over cost are those things that we don't see. So I want to introduce uh, the concept of the cone of uncertainty. The cone of uncertainty. <laughs> and this is a, uh, just a graphical representation of as we're working on a project, you know, across the bottom line, this is really, uh, you can call this project the project execution timeline. And you can see is that as we start getting 
from the initial concept, and, and this is this is the crystal ball part of it. You know, of like, I think I'd like some software. What would it take to, to build that software? Uh, all the way over to the right when it's complete. You know, on that final day, we know what the cost of this software to construct it has been. Uh, and you see what's happening is we're moving across that axis across the bottom is we're getting more requirements. But as, if you look on the left, what happens is uh, this cone is really big, is that you know, of the estimate of the scope of the project, you know, as it, as it comes to what it finally comes out to, is you go from like uh, 0.25 to four times, well, that's a 16 times uh, um, factor, you know, and, and that's really huge. And what happens is, is if as an estimator, you know, I'm thinking uh, up at the 4x level when I'm, I'm estimating the project, and the client or the consumer of that is down, what they're wanting is they're wanting that 60-hour uh, e-commerce site. You know, they have a very simple uh, requirements. You know, it's pretty easy. You know, but I'm thinking, you know, about this 4,000-hour project I've worked on, you know, we're, we're just miles apart. So how do, what we're going to talk about uh, following this is uh, how do we get uh, to a place further on the right of this curve. <clears throat> so the next concept I have is uh, the concept of structure for projects. And structure um, can be either software structure or it can be business requirements. Um, early in my software development career, uh, we took on a project um, where we were doing some business automation of, of process. And what happened was uh, the internal process was, uh, you know, Sue took an order, she typed it on her machine, you know, then that was printed out, then that was handed off to someone else that entered, entered it into uh, the order processing system, then that generated a a uh, file that someone had to carry to someone else's desk. Uh, so this can either be, you know, a business process that has loose structure, or if you're talking about software, it can also be that, uh, you know, the the process of how you're putting the software together does not have uh, have a lot of structure to it. So what is what is the opposite of that loose structure? Um, so here is the quarter pounder. If I go to McDonald's in Atlanta and get a quarter pounder, it has the same amount of pickles on it. That burger weighs the same. The bun is the same. If I go to Portland, Oregon and get one, it's the same. If I go to LA, it's the same. It's a very highly structured um, product. Um, and delicious. <laughs> maybe. You know, but but hamburgers vary all over, right? So, part of what we we want to do in order to produce estimates is to get the work that we're doing structured. Is we want to build a burger. You know, we don't want changes later. We don't want. Uh, you know, we want to estimate and line out what we're actually going to be delivering. Um, Let's also analyze our projects. <laughs> exactly. Um, there's also a, a number of points of estimates that we're working. Often, the crystal ball type of estimate is a project sizing estimate. It may be, uh, you know, and these are sort of uh, conversations where you have like, uh, you know, is it. Uh, bigger than a bread basket or bigger than an elephant? You know, like what, what kind of size is it? You know, is it a, a sales estimate or a response to a, a, an, F, an RFP? You know, as a project manager, I often get projects that are uh, come in and we are initiating the project, so I'm, I'm estimating the amount of effort that's needed for uh, resources. Um, 
you know, is it inside of a project estimation, um, or is this for you know an ongoing project that is going to be for support? And all of those uh, are sort of considerations that we need to take in as you're uh, considering the type of estimate you're creating. So this is um, the next section for what what do we do to manage this confusion and, and chaos? Like how can we drive that estimate down that that's uh, going to be clear of what we're trying to, to hit at the end that gives us that project that can deliver um, the targets that we're we're wanting. So. What you want to build is you want to build an estimate that is defensible to yourself, it's defensible to your dev team, it's defensible to the client and to the sales team. You know, so this means that it's strong, it's uh, well defined, uh, and you know we have something that that everyone can agree on that's that's solid. And it um, happens to be beautiful too. You like that? Do do you want a castle? I think we all want a castle. If a project could be a castle, sign me up. Um, so in the estimation project process, what I'm going to talk about, and there's, there's a, a lot of material on the subject of estimation. Uh, this presentation is a lot about strategies for those estimations because there are so many different types of estimates we're doing. Uh, so part of that strategy is we want to price what we know. We want to know when it's different. Uh, and we want to look at our prior projects for estimating and get some, um, some uh, information on what our company or what your organization has done with prior projects. Uh, we're also going to be talking about using uh, resources uh, that that you work with. So, uh, as a software project manager and estimator, uh, the technique we use a lot is we're working. You want to work with people that know about what you're building. And in Drupal, uh, there's a lot of different modules. Uh, part of what we have is we have a team of people that have different skills and those people have experience with the different types, types of projects we do. So as we're working with um, e-commerce or we're working with an association management system or we're working with uh, a marketing site, you know, those all have, you know, they have some similarities but they have differences as well. And um, one of the strategies we, we use is relying on those resources to estimate the projects themselves. You know, as developers, um, I borrowed this from industry data, but we find this internally. And uh, working with developers and developers working on projects, they tend to be very optimistic about the amount of work they can get done, even though uh, managers may say, you know, wow, that's a that's a an estimate, uh, and that's a lot. Is that typically resources, whether we're talking about design resources, uh, developers, sysadmin folks, uh, we find that in general that those estimates are an experienced person doing them has an optimism factor of 20 to 30 percent because often those resources are thinking about only the work that they do. Um, one, they want to deliver the project, um, you know, for just the time it takes to do the project, but they may not be uh, including time for project management, for client meetings, for design meetings, for status type meetings. So, uh, in building these estimates, uh, that is one of the factors we look at as we're we're building the project. <clears throat> do you think that's because in an ideal world? developers would prefer not to talk to anybody? I think that probably has a lot to do with it. We love developers, obviously. We do. Um, 
also, like as we're creating documents, so what we're going to be doing is as, an, as you're creating an estimate, those estimates have to be done with the person wanting the estimate. So at ProMAT, some of our projects are internal, some of them are with clients, um, you know, or some of them may be in association with partners that we're working with. And those partners will, uh, you know, they will describe what they need. So, you know, in my example I keep using, it's like, we want an e-commerce site. Well, the job as, a, as an estimator and as a project team is to translate those into user stories uh, that will define this in a way that at that project end, what you're delivering is what the person was expecting. Um, so uh, we use a technique called uh, the work breakdown structure. Uh, if you look in uh, project estimation, uh, this will also be called the Delphi estimation method. And what the Delphi estimation method is, uh, one, it sounds really cool if you use this. You know, you uh, you get extra points for using the Delphi estimation method. It's really nothing more complex than making a list. Different people on a team making a list and estimating the work that needs to be done um, into. Um, into functional requirements for the for the work. It's really important when this is done that that estimate is separate. Now, often, uh, ProMet, what we'll do is, you know, a team member will construct the estimate. Uh, someone else will review that on the team, whether it's someone at the uh, same level as far as a developer working that estimate, or whether it's uh, being reviewed by a manager or the someone on the sales team. There's a couple really critical things when we're breaking down the work is um, you're going to come up with a, a document and the form of that document may vary depending on your organization about how that work is um, is defined. Uh, you may use a spreadsheet, you may use a document, you may use user stories, all of those are, are valid ways of estimating and they vary greatly from company to company, but what you need is you need some agreement on what is is. Uh, and what you're looking for in these lists is that uh, everyone makes their list, they come back and compare, and uh, if you've done this right, uh, there will be some sparks at the end, is that I may say, we're going to use Drupal, we're going to use uh, e-commerce, we're going to build our own recurring payment system, and maybe a developer will come back and say, well, you know, there's a third-party service that does that, that's what we should use, and, you know, this is why I think that's different. But what you're trying to uncover is uh, if we go back to our uh, our chart earlier, and we're, we're over on the, the one with the, the bell curve with a sharp line on the left, is we're trying to uncover items in the work that's going to be done in the project that one person's vision doesn't, uh, doesn't carry. So if there's custom work to be done, if there's an import to be done, uh, you're wanting to uncover and reveal that work uh, early. Uh, this works very work breakdown structure works very good for uh, custom development work. Uh, there are some other items, and one of the reasons we use Drupal at uh, ProMet is because Drupal. Um, most of our projects are Drupal. We have experience in it. Drupal is a rapid development framework and has a lot of modules that are reusable. So as we're we're doing work. We're not having to, even though each project is different, we're not having to redevelop the wheel every time to deliver that project. Or reinvent the burger. Huh? Exactly. Very good. We're, uh, we're not going out and doing that every time. So we talked a little bit about custom work here with work breakdown structures. Um, for doing the estimates, you can also uh, use uh, calibration. 
And calibration is really uh, how long on average does it take, you know, my organization? How long on average does it take the industry to do this? Or, you know, how long does it take for this project to do something? And uh, I borrowed this again from Steve McConnell's book. Uh, there's a couple, um, you know, I've worked on a, a number of projects, and sometimes what will happen is, uh, you know, let's say we're talking about uh, theming a website. And theming that website, uh, one of the requirements may be that we're going to use a responsive web design. You know, as an industry average, um, you know, we may look up and we may research that and say, well, on the average for the industry, that adds 30% uh, more theming time. But I look at my organizational data uh, and I say, you know, based on the last 10 projects we've done, you know, adding responsive theming adds 40% uh, to the project. And that uh, is going to be a higher use than the industry average because maybe, maybe it takes 40% more because we're very effective at uh, the software development portion of it, and that portion is smaller. So uh, you need to have some um, critical thinking and kind of examination when you're using industry average averages for estimating because um, it's much better to use your own organizational data about prior projects, other works that you've done on, because that is how much your organization uses. Uh, you know, if you're a client looking for estimate, uh, an estimate, uh, you know, this is, you know, someone who has done a project before, who has worked with e-commerce, who has worked with responsive theming, those are going to be much more accurate than someone who's relying on uh, an industry average and pulling that information based on how long would this take. The very highest um, calibration is with project-specific data, uh, and that is actually where some members of the team participate in the, the work breakdown structure, uh, list out the work, and come up with how long for this project does it take. Uh, typically, that is much more appropriate in the middle or late stages of a project because you have to have some structure for this project in order to know uh, what that estimate is going to be. So we've talked about doing work breakdown stu structures. We've talked about using calibration. Uh, another really critical thing for your estimates is uh, dealing with the unknowns and dealing with the knowns. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier at ProMet, we have a number of resources that have different skills. Some of those skills lie in uh, theming, design. Some of those skills are in e-commerce. Some of them are in integrations. So for specific projects, uh, when we are doing estimates, you know, some of the things we list is we list out the project team, because project team members um, are not necessarily interchangeable. Uh, you know, you have folks that have specific knowledge and experience, and they're going to be um, they're going to be better at some activities than others. Uh, technical assumptions; uh, those are uh, very critical. You know, what modules are we using? What, how are we? Uh, you know, is there an integration? Is there? You know, what does that integration look like? What's that expectation of how? Uh, the project is constructed. Uh, if there's timeline requirements, we talked about um, having a target, and that target may be uh, a time in the future. So uh, when that time is in the future, you may put some assumptions and say, you know, we're going to do, we're estimating this in this way to reach this timeline. It may not meet all of the uh, you may have to change the requirements, but in order to meet this timeline, that's a that's a an assumption. Um, dropping down, uh, I have a line just about user stories. So user stories are um, at one time when when I was estimating, 
we did lots of estimates where we listed sort of the building blocks of uh, if we were building a house we'd say well you know this takes uh, you know 4,020 concrete blocks we're going to use this many nails uh, for software uh, generally we find that user stories are better so you know uh, as a company we would like to have e-commerce as our we'd like to have e-commerce so people can purchase our products and that may be an epic story you know and the stories underneath that will be um, you know as a user I need to be able to log in create an account create my order um, and user stories tend to be more understandable both by clients and developers so that we understand like what the use is going to be of the project at the end. Um, stating your critical path items, if there are uh, integrations, lists of users, um, critical path items in the estimates are super important to list early on and, and they help flesh out uh, what you need to deliver. Uh, we generally estimate in um, in sizes of time for projects. So as we're doing that, when we're estimating time, um, we use sort of a modified uh, Fibonacci sequence, uh, which is our sizes, uh, increments of 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16 hours. And the reason we're using those hours is we found that uh, if it's a project and if it's a task and it's knowable, that those are increments that uh, developers, people can have a large uh, confidence about what they can get accomplished. Uh, once that number goes something between beyond two days, um, there are often hidden tasks that don't uh, are not revealed. So if I say something is uh, three days of time or four days of time. Uh, it's likely that that is not um, defined enough to assure me that there to assure me and the, the client that there's not enough um, that there's some other task in there that is sort of hidden. I, I call those submarines. Uh, so most of the time, what you're really saying is if you throw some large amount of time on something for a development task. Uh, that task is actually bigger than than what you think. So our internal team will uh, often question anything that is is beyond that timeline to help flesh out the unknowns. Really applies well to development tasks. Um, beyond development tasks, there's a number of other tasks that we look at that we know are a part of every project for um, that we're we're working and after we have an estimate typically we're building that in a uh, in a couple documents uh, both a word document or Google Doc for requirements and listing user stories and then converting that into a spreadsheet um, is we also know based on looking that at other projects we've done that there are a number of similar activities that work for all projects we work on, that all of them have some requirements gathering, all have front-end development. We have theming time. We have project management, quality assurance, DevOps. These are all activities that have to be done. So looking at a project and breaking that time out and knowing what are the percentages of those amounts of times for other projects, uh, this, is, this is a calibration activity we're going through. So we've done the work breakdown. We've listed out our spreadsheet, but we're also going to come back and do a calibration and say, you know, in this estimate, you know, have we have we adequately adequately considered how much project management time is? Have we adequately considered how much QA time? You know, maybe there's too much here. Maybe there's not enough. But that gives an, an external check of. Um, what are the activities that we need to have to uh, deliver the project? So going back to your burger analogy, you know, it's getting close to noon. I'm sure we all want to hear about burgers. 
But these pieces are the different parts of the burger, like the bread, the bun, the pickle, the ketchup. Who is hungry? Yeah, they're 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 parts of it. Um, there are types. Of, there's you know this the bun, this the the filling. You know like these these are the different types of things. What I think you're talking about is what are the actual components. So part of that burger is uh, in software is going to be what are the common modules. And you know in, in Drupal there I think there are twenty four thousand different modules available on D.O. One of the strategies we use for creating good estimates is we have common lists of modules and common activities that we've done. So if we're talking about implementing workflow, if we're talking about social sharing, SEO, what is our core Drupal, uh, contributive modules. So instead of just saying, you know, we're going to put meat on that burger, you know, we're saying, you know, we're going to put, you know, a four ounce burger or or a six ounce or eight ounce. You know, you're saying what is this? What is our standard implementation? And what is this what are the parameters for those items? You know, like a, a hamburger bun can be, you know, it can be uh, like a white castle size bun or you know, this can be you know, a Big Mac, this can be a really huge, but specifying exactly what that is uh, and those common activities um, really help you get an estimate that's going to have a high degree of confidence that when you get to the end of the project is what everyone is expecting. Um, what we do is we, uh, we try to work with what we know. so. Uh, ProMed has a lot of experience with uh, AMS systems. We have SSO. We have billing, e-commerce. There's a lot of, of ground there. So when we know uh, items that are going to be done, uh, we know about training. We know about DevOps. You know, like that experience of what you've done on those prior projects are going to really define what you need to be delivering uh, what you need to include on that estimate. So, you know, billing e-commerce, I, I in particular have a lot of background with that, those projects. So when those projects come through our team to be estimated, uh, I'm usually involved in those because uh, of prior experience. So, you know, that may be, you know, what kind of products do we have? And, and it's very different, you know, so if I'm doing a digital download of a project and I just need to have access to that, that's very different than uh, an e-commerce project where um, the type product we're selling, you know, has is a physical product. It may have to be shipped from a warehouse. It's got, you know, weight, size, volume, shipping parameters. It may come in different colors. Uh, knowing what those different parameters are and inputting that into my uh, documents are going to really increase the accuracy of that estimate. An essential part of estimates that I, I often see missing in is listing the risk of those estimates. So um, often in estimates, you know, there is a, we've listed everything we know. We've uh, you know we we've, we've got a requirements document. We've got our spreadsheet. Uh, so without a statement of what risk are also in that estimate, you know, uh, just simple things of, you know, this estimate's based on this information that was provided. Um, you know, it's assumed that this is full and complete, you know, that there's not additional integrations, there's not additional imports, inputs. Um, you know, that uh, is very important if there's, um, if it's an existing project, uh, you know, if, if the code of the project has not been reviewed, you know, some kind of statement about uh, the state of the other project, if there's any technical debt, if there's any code refactoring that may need to be done. You know, if we're assuming that there's no work on the other system that needs to be done, that needs to be included uh, 
that needs to be included in our estimate and clearly stated that you know uh, these API integrations, we assume we have the entire list. If that's not the entire list, then that's not included. And you know I found that very satisfying for both as a uh, being on the estimation team and both as a client. Uh, raising that up and getting that in the estimate is uh, really critical. Um, infrastructure is an, is an item that's often uh, left out. We work with a lot of universities. We work with some government agencies. Uh, you know, they have very different uh, infrastructure. So uh, knowing and being aware of not only what is the software we're, we're building, but where is that software going to live? You know, are there compliance requirements? Those really, um, really greatly affect uh, the project and that accuracy at the end. <coughs> and I've left this for last as talking about people conditions. Um, working on projects, uh, the people you have involved in the project are, are a risk and needed to be uh, listed. So as you're working with a project um, and an estimation, uh, it's really important that, especially if we're, we're going for a commitment type of estimate, uh, that both the client and the company you're working with, the person you're estimating with, are involved and responsive. So if that's not happening on both sides of that estimate, um, you know, or maybe if um, on the client side someone's not technically savvy, you know, that needs to be, um, that needs to be uh, addressed as well so that, um, you know, if a different resource needs to be added that's maybe more familiar with the technical details if you're talking about, um, if you're talking about integrations, that's really a very critical portion. So um, we're about 45 minutes here, and I, I'm going to kind of summarize. Is uh, you know, let's talk about okay. So we're ready to build our burger. You know, part of it is what kind of estimate is it? You know, we talked about you know, is it a is it a guesstimate, a crystal ball? Is it a target? Is it uh, you know, is this a commitment that we're going to be working toward? Each one of those require a different presentation of the requirements and a different listing. And as an estimator, you should uh, try to define what type of estimate it is and do a correct uh, proposal from that. Uh, you want to build your projects with structure. Um, use your work breakdown structure. List out your modules. Uh, get the requirements that you need. Uh, list your assumptions, uh, use your work breakdown structure, and list the risk. And if you do those things, I think you're going to wind up with estimates that are much closer on that uh, cone of uncertainty over to the right oh, to have successful estimates. All right, and that concludes my uh, presentation, so uh, I'm ready for questions if we have those. Well, that was just great, Johnny. I think we all learned a lot about project management and building a burger, building a castle, and really just satisfying clients. So at this point, we're going to uh, open the forum up to questions. Feel free to send me something in the chat. It's one question that I particularly like a lot from Lyndall Cairn is, how do you cope when someone important wants to change a major part of the project halfway through? I'm sure we've all been in that circumstance before. Take it, Johnny. All right. Well, you know, I, I talked about building a castle, right? You know, yeah. is, is we want we want estimates that are defensible. So if on our estimate and our proposal we've defined what something is, uh, uh, really two things. Like we want that estimate to be defensible. And so when someone asks for that, it's really important 
to have an idea of what you were doing in the first place. Uh, you know, and this is going to depend on your on your contract and how that's that's written as well. But if if you define what was estimated and the work to be done, then that discussion about hey, that's something you want to change is a change is really an easy discussion like oh this is very different than what's estimated that's a significant difference that's not in our assumptions that's not defined what's here um, you know so that becomes a change order you know and because someone wants that and uh, you know, like we at ProMet use, uh, I personally am a, a scrum master, you know, we use a, an agile development method and, and we get changes. But what, you, what your estimate needs to be and your proposal needs to be is that defined document that's defendable to say, oh, this is a change. In our estimate, we already have talked about, you know, what the timeline is. If we're going to change this, then this has changed what's going to be delivered and then as a, you know as an estimator as a project team as a as a software provider you know we regularly have conversations about you know if you want to change this it would be a change and a change order and that affects um, it almost always affects project timeline and almost always affects project cost so I have a couple of follow-up questions so let's say it is a major change that is different than the original estimation. Uh, one, do you estimate that change again? And two, do you factor in change orders when you're estimating? So, yeah, if, I mean, if it's a change, it's new work, and it's got to be estimated. You know, it's we you can't take that change in without uh, without looking at it. So, um, you know, maybe it's a, a change to the design of the project. Maybe it's a change of the theming. You know, that uh, that has to be estimated. Um, what was the second part? The second part is, you know, when you're factoring in the risk. Do you factor in uh, the idea that a contact wants may want changes as the project progresses? So we have worked on a number of projects where we've done this sort of thing, and we will put a um, you know a percentage of design or a percentage of additional work to be done that's declared very clearly on the contract. Uh, if it, you know, if we are working and that's in the contract, there will be an allocation for in-project changes, you know, up to X amount. Uh, that's clear on the front end. And then when you estimate, you may say, uh, so you get that change request. The client requests it, says, oh, you know, we've we've figured out that now on user management, we need to have our CSRs able to log in and change client orders. Uh, you know, there's going to be a set of permissions for that. Uh, so that amount of work would be estimated and then uh, that would be cost uh, against that allocation or the allotment in the contract. And it may be that, you know, yes, that change fits right in there. You know, like we're not going to have to, uh, to adjust to that. Uh, but there would be a, a budget item and if it's in excess of that, then you know that would be a discussion about for the things you need. The things you've described here are going to be in excess of our changes that we've budgeted for. Um, you know, how do we want to address that? Is that a, is that cut requirements or is that an additional amount? Fantastic. We have another question, and it's a long one, so get ready. All right. In, in large projects. A team needs to plan to perform estimation and schedule that activity. Based on the size of the project, it could be a one day, one week, one month, etc. activity. In your experience, any rules of thumb for how much time a team ought to allocate to estimation based upon the size of the project? 
For example, if you have an X hour project, a team should allocate, one moment, I just lost the rest of that, a team should <laughs> allocate Y hours for estimation. Obviously, there are lots of variables, i.e. team skill, experience, clarity of recs, et cetera. But any rules of thumb? All right. So I, um, I found this to be very different across projects that I've worked on. So I'll, a little bit of my background is I have worked in other technologies other than uh, Drupal. So I've worked in uh, .NET and I've worked also in iOS projects, and I find that the amount of time varies um, based on the type of technology you're working on. Uh, with Drupal, typically we're estimating uh, the estimation and then project estimation as a part of uh, the project management time that is uh, part of the weekly meetings and uh, for the staff, so you know, as it's smaller projects, I don't find that it has to be estimated, um, you know, as a line item. On larger projects, it, it gets more significant, but I, I don't find on Drupal projects that it's um, it's not a line item that I uh, I call out uh, in the software world. Um, you know, just kind of as um, as a um, context, um, I have a, a sister that works with, with Rackspace and works on projects that are uh, multi-million dollar projects where they will carry it as a line item. And on Drupal projects, I have not uh, carried estimation as a line item because for Drupal projects, um, you know, a thousand hour project or two thousand hour project is, um, you know, is, is a very large project. Uh, for some other technologies, uh, you know, a, a thousand hours may not even be, um, wouldn't even get you enough hours for a two-week sprint. Estimating estimations. It sounds like an entirely new topic, doesn't it? <laughs> it is. So let's say like for an extra large project, whatever that may be, Let's say for us it's 2,000 hours. Uh, how long do you think it would take to estimate that? Oh, we're talking about the initial project estimation? Yes. Um, we handle that a little bit of a different way. Is if, it, if it is a large project, often what we will do is a sprint zero that is a design. So there will be an initial discussion, and at some point, uh, in the sales process, you know, we've talked about the project, and based on our prior experience, it'll be a discussion of something like, "This looks to be a very large project. You know, this project could be in excess of a thousand hours. It could be two thousand hours. We don't know enough about that project yet to to do that. Um, you know, for all of us to be." Um, to have a high confidence we can deliver it and meet a budget, uh, we will often propose a sprint zero, which is a, a, a design and requirements gathering project. Um, so, you know, as a percentage, you know, for a uh, 1,000 hour project, you know, typically the sales process uh, that I've seen is that's not going to happen uh, with less than um, 25 to 50 hours of pre um, uh, pre time prep time and, and design time for doing that but if it's if it's larger and there's requirements that's usually something the sales team addresses and, and may do a um, a sprint zero uh, you know that may involve some client uh, trips or in-person meetings just depending on how large that um, you know, how large the opportunity is and, and kind of what the need is. Fantastic. Well, it is just a little bit afternoon. I, afternoon. I know we started just a little bit late, so we will try to end on time. And thanks again, Johnny. That was really just 
a great overview on project estimation and everything that you can do to avoid risk and estimate uh, really well, even though we have that tone of uncertainty. So hopefully <laughs> everyone is ready to start implementing your tips today. To learn more about Promet Source, please visit our website, prometsource.com. And of course, we will invite you to our next webinar, which will be coming up in April. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm Maggie, Maggie at prometsource.com. And Johnny's contact information is right on the screen. And uh, you can reach him there. And again, Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.